high. This is day two. We're finishing up chapter 23, which is uh, the Gilded Age, and there's a lot of things that are in the Gilded Age that are very significant. Here are the presidents. I put them on the board with the last year that they're actually president. Andrew Johnson, U.S. Grant, remember he had a lot of corruption and stuff. Rutherford B. Hayes basically was a Republican, so technically, again, he's by nature a Democrat, Republican, Republican Garfield, who got shot, we talked about him yesterday. This Chester Arthur person, who basically came from upstate New York, never held elective office before, was a fan of the civil service, and but did make the Pendleton, the Pendleton Act, which we talked about yesterday. You can see the years. Go over Cleveland the first time, and then basically Benjamin Harrison, we'll talk more about this. Go over Cleveland again, he's the only two-term non-consecutive term president. He's the 22nd and 20, 24th president. And then William McKinley, who's the 25th president, who uh, eventually got assassinated in 1901. The general thing is, after Lincoln, a lot of the presidents stuck. The view is that there's corruption, one term guy got assassinated, you know, it's going to sound odd, but we really didn't have a foreign policy as the United States. Like half the president's job is generally foreign policy. Our foreign policy, you actually know what it is. I'll even tell you the year it started. 1823. What was our foreign policy until 1917 in World War I? MD. Monroe. Monroe Doctrine. Monroe Doctrine. And what, what was that? Ellie, tell me. Uh, it's uh, bringing me back. We, uh, well, what, what was it? I mean, we maintained the policy for a hundred years or more. It was, uh, it was like that. We don't like, we don't like interfere. We don't interfere. Neutral. Yeah, we have no allies. We don't want allies. Keep us out of European affairs and we'll mind our own business. And we did. We did a very good job of that. Uh, we came close to a couple of wars with people. We, even when we fought Mexico, we fought, we fought them alone. When we fought Spain, in the, which is, we haven't learned that yet, in 1898, under that man, William McKinley, we had no allies. We didn't want any allies. The last ally we have is France, and they almost dragged us into a lot of difficulties with the XYZ affair and sealing our ships and the quasi war and all that other bad stuff. The general sentiment is these presidents, particularly after Lincoln and to McKinley, stink. They don't do anything. They generally let Congress run things. Now, the guy who replaced McKinley after McKinley was assassinated in the second term, you definitely know. Last president with a mustache. Actually, not such Second to last president with a mustache. Glasses, bad vision, Long Island guy. Was the governor of New York? Teddy? Uh, Teddy Roosevelt. Teddy Roosevelt, who became a hero in the Spanish American War. So these presidents really don't do a great deal of stuff. But what's significant, I mean, impeached, corrupt. I mean, he, Grant is, he's not per, we had another guy like that in the 1920s named Warren Harding. We'll learn about him. He's not personally corrupt, although in Harding's case, he really was. He was a disastrously bad person to be married to. But he had terrible judgment. He, Grant chose really bad people to work for him. He never had political office before, which might sound refreshing, but it came to haunt the country because he had no idea what he was doing. So Hayes was a one-term guy. He's the guy that ended Reconstruction we talked about yesterday in 1877, took the federal troops out. We said he got assassinated, uh, Garfield, and then we basically have Chester A. Arthur, Chet Arthur from New so York, who makes the Pendleton Act, exactly. And he uh, basically is a one-term guy, and he, Cleveland's gonna be there twice. So let's take a look. So from our perspective, this is a man who could have been president. We don't know if he would have done a very good job. He doesn't live that long, so that's sort of a negative. His name is James Blaine, and he's a senator from the state of, it rhymes with Blaine, Maine. He's a Maine senator. The thing about him, he's sort of corrupt. He's a Republican from Maine. And again, remember what, what I said generally about the presidents in the Gilded Age. They don't do much. They just, they don't really have harsh opinions. They don't think, they, 
But the president, whoever is president in modern times, likes to lead Congress, like on a leash. Every president in the modern era has done that. They're like, I will tell Congress what to do. Trump does that. Obama did that to some extent. Ronald Reagan did that. The difference is these presidents generally let things go to a term, French term that you're probably familiar with, LF, laissez-faire. You ever heard of that term? It's not like hands off. It's hands like off, not to get ter terribly involved in the economy. So, and they didn't. They generally, this guy could have been a good president. Um, he had been Secretary of the Navy, if I remember correctly, he was Secretary of State. He was mixed water of the Navy. He's a friend of a lot of the, guild, of the, the Republican Gilded Age presidents. He's a great politician, but he's running against the first Democrat who was actually going to win the, the, the presidency. This Grover Cleveland is, first of all, he's from Caldwell, but he was the mayor of Buffalo. He was the governor of New York, and he's a Democrat. And Grover Cleveland and James Blaine are going to go head to head in this big election in 1884. So the reality is, you say, well, what's so significant about this election? A couple things. James Blaine is sort of corrupt. Sort of, yeah, yeah, he's sort of corrupt. So that's essentially, he's involved in a lot of money making schemes. He was a, he's a senator. He made a lot of money. He's a good, very close personal friend of uh, James Garfield, who got assassinated. Uh, he was Secretary of State. He'd done a number of interesting things. Grover Cleveland has no national experience of any kind. No. He's only been the governor of New York for a couple of years. So, by the way, Teddy Roosevelt became go was governor of New York too, years later. There's a problem. It comes out during the 1884 race that he sort of fathered a child out of wedlock. He was single. Cleveland. Cleveland. And that Blaine's people talk about how, uh, how immoral it was at the time. That they couldn't do any DNA or blood testing, anything. None of that stuff's going to be existing for over 100 years. So Grover Cleveland owned up to it and said, yeah, I think, I, I think the child is mine, and I'm taking care of it. Now, Blaine's people said, Ma, talking, talking criticizing Garth, uh, Grover Cleveland, Ma, Ma, where's my pa? That was the criticism that James Blaine and these Republicans made on Grover Cleveland. And Cleveland, now, if you're asking me who's more corrupt, Blaine is. But people really respected that Grover Cleveland owned up to it and said, I think the child is mine, and I've been taking care of that child. I was not, he, he, was, he was a bachelor. He got married while he was president, actually. He'd never been married before until like, he's 48 years old. So he owned up to it. There were a group of people called mugwumps. It's a weird phrase. What they are are pro-reform pro-clean government kind of Republicans. What's weird, Cleveland is a Democrat. He's the first elected Democrat since James Buchanan, who was the president right before Lincoln. Mm -hmm. Even though I said Aaron Johnson was a Democrat, he wasn't elected. He was vice president who took over when Lincoln was assassinated. So the, one of the things that Grover Cleveland wanted to do is reduce tariffs. That's a big issue. So let's take a look at that. Tariffs are a big thing. There are a number of major issues. We talked about some of them already during the Gilded Age. Currency, like what we're going to use for money, gold, silver, gold only, right, greenbacks. There's another thing I want to basically tell you about, which you can sort of visualize. These are all issues of the Gilded Age. And the fourth issue, basically, so that's one, two, I'll explain this in a second, three, and four, and that one would be civil service, which we took care of with the panel today. So check this out. We talked a lot, and it will still be a big issue in the 1800s, uh, about what we should back our currency with, gold, silver, whatever. What would be best? 
So that's one of the, that's going to be a recurring issue. Let me just make sure we're still recording. The second issue is tariffs. What should be the taxes on foreign goods? And I should tell you, the number one source of revenue for, the, for, the, for, the, for, the, for our federal government, they had no income tax, it wasn't legal. The number one source of revenue for our government was tariffs. And people said, high tariffs, Trump sort of believes this now, that high tariffs are going to protect American jobs at our American factories. Now, that's, that, could, that could happen. There is something about high tariffs. And the tariff could range from anything from 10%, which they really aren't 10%. They're more like 25 to 40%. Let me explain. A $10 pair of shoes with a 40% tariff is going to be $14 shoes. Who would not like $14 shoes? Consumers. I want the $11, $10 shoes. I'd like no tariff. <laughs> I want the cheap stuff. Um, we don't have a lot of tariffs until President Trump. We, our number one source of revenue, meaning mon government money for the run our stupid federal government, was tariffs, taxes on foreign goods. And they were done at the port. And remember that uh, Chester A. Arthur had been the port commissioner some years earlier before he was president of the Port of New York, which is our busiest port. So he wanted to lower tariffs, but he doesn't do that much. He's not a really big doer, but he's the first Democrat elected since 19, uh, 1856, and he's not a bad president. He will be president again years later, but he did try to reduce the tariff. But most people said, and again, mugwumps over here are people who are pro-reform Republicans who say, I'm not going to vote for Blaine, who lost to him, because Blaine is too corrupt, and I want a clean government guy. And Grover, I called him Grover the Good. Grover of Cleveland can do that. He's a clean government guy. The problem is, since he's the first elected Democrat in a long time, a lot of Democrat people wanted him to give them jobs in the federal government. Well, at least we had the Pendleton Act by now, right? So that helped back in the 18, in a couple years earlier, in 1883. So what's also significant is, in 1888, four years went by, and this man, who's a Republican, he's a little guy, uh, Benjamin Harrison, you might remember the last name, his grandfather was William Henry Harrison, who, who, who died in like, in like a month, exactly. He died very quickly, and this man has experience in the Civil War, he had become a general in the Civil War, he's the grandson of a former president, and he is going to face off against Grover Cleveland in the 1888 election. He is, this man Benjamin Harrison, who's about that tall, is a big to believe, he's from Indiana. Indiana and Ohio and New York basically dominated the presidency for this whole era. Uh, and that's largely true. He's from Indiana. His grandfather had been like territorial governor of Indiana. He said, Benjamin Harrison, he gets elected, even though he didn't get as many votes, he got enough electoral votes. It's one of the cases where the Democrat lost because the Republican had the, the right number of electors to win. But the popular vote, which is nationwide popular vote, which technically means nothing, the nationwide popular vote voted for Cleveland. But Benjamin Harrison is significant for a couple of reasons. One of the reasons he's significant is because in peacetime, he was the first peacetime president to spend a billion dollars. He thought, let's ramp up those taxes, those tariffs, which are taxes on foreign goods. Let's ramp up the tariffs. Let's basically give out jobs to people basically who are Republicans and give big fat pensions to people who served in the Civil War on the Union side. There's another thing I want to basically tell you. And again, this one, you can sort of figure this one out. It's called the bloody shirt. That's the, that's the third issue. So it's currency, tariffs, bloody shirt, and civil service. Let me explain. The Republicans won the Civil War. Lincoln's Republic. The Democrats are generally on the Confederate side, or they are not fans of Lincoln because he's a Republican. The thing, reality is the pre-Civil War Confederacy was Democrat. And Republicans would basically haunt Democrats 
after the Civil War with, you know, maybe not every Democrat was, uh, you know, I mean, like, you know, killed Union Northern soldiers of Lincoln. But let's face it, the Confederacy was a Democratic Party institution. Only during the Reconstruction period did the Republicans actually have um, the power until they basically 77, the Democrats got back. We called that term uh, when the Democrats got back in power? Redemption. Redemption. The Redeemers got back in power and they stayed in power until the 1960s. 1960s, that's a long time. So what's significant, Benjamin Harrison, he's not going to get any Southern support because he was a Union general. But he thought, I like big fat tariffs. He runs what is basically known as the Billion Dollar Congress. And he spent, he's the first part, he spent the Treasury blunt. He basically, we actually, it's going to sound odd. You know we have budget deficits, like we take in X amount of money, but we spend X plus like a trillion dollars, that's a budget deficit. He gave tons of money to veterans of the, of the Civil War on the northern side. He thought that they should all get pensions and money and take care of them. The problem is it ballooned up the government. Let me explain his bloody shirt thing. An Ohio congressman who was a Republican, most Ohio congressmen were Republican, Grant was a Republican. Um, Republican congressman during Reconstruction brought into the Congress a shirt that was all beat up, covered with blood. It was a shirt that belonged to an Ohio carpetbagger who went south to go help the South, don't you know? Now, some carpetbaggers did go to the South to help the South, to help black people and others went down there for personal gain. Remember what I said yesterday, the Civil War is about corruption, it just is. So what is significant is when Republicans in this era, in the, the Reconstruction and the Gilded Age, when I'm, if I'm a Republican and I'm running against a Democrat, I'm gonna basically bring up the bloody shirt because the bloody shirt, there was a, an actual, supposedly, Ohio per person had gone to the South to try to help the South, help the South, and he got, the snot beat out of him, and the shirt was all bloody. So if I'm in a tough campaign as a Republican against a Democrat, I'm very tempted to pull up, bring up the whole bloody shirt thing all over again, and say, you know, Ellie, those, those Confederates were all Democrats. They're the party of the traitors. Their party betrayed the Union, and a Democrat did kill Abraham Lincoln, too. And that, they, would haunt, they would haunt the Democrats with that. Now, the thing about this is, Grover Cleveland is going to be, you know, he'll be president uh, again, only two term, non consecutive term president, the 22nd and 24th president, and they tried to use it against him. Why do you think they couldn't use the bloody shirt against him? Think about where he's from. I told you, he's born in New Jersey. So he's not from the Confederacy. He's not from the Confederacy. He was the governor of New York. And that has nothing to do with the Confederacy, although it's the same party, the Democrats. So what's significant, Benjamin Harrison spent a ton of money, and then Grover Cleveland ran again in 1892 and won, which was unusual, two, again, two term on consecutive term presidents, and that was really interesting. I want to basically point out a couple things that were going on around that, around that time. Unions were just getting founded. Unions are, you know, where workers join a union. You may know, of course, about the baseball players' union and the basketball players' union and uh, the Teamsters who basically cart stuff from one place to another by track and trailer. What's significant, the country, even at its peak, of union representation was in the 1950s, where in the, in the 1950s, about 34% of people who were American workers belonged to a union. That being said, one of the things that's really significant is there are some very serious strikes. Ali, tell me about what a strike is. Uh, people refuse to work for various reasons. Usually money. Usually. So they're, they're in this Gilded Age. There are some, like, oh, we have strikes today, but they're, they're not that violent. Like, people don't die. What's significant, though, is there were some major strikes in this era. Now, I will tell you that no gov no, the government doesn't like unions. And the only president who's going to like unions even, uh, even a little bit 
is going to basically be Teddy Roosevelt in 1900 or so, and particularly his cousin, Franklin Roosevelt, was a big union guy. But unions were, people just sort of looked at unions sort of like a criminal conspiracy. Oh, you're plotting against the business owner. You're plotting against them in secret meetings of you and your workers. And again, the idea, and again, the thing about a union is that you believe in something called collective bargaining. So let me erase this. Collective bargaining is where people say, okay, I'm going to basically join this union and the union will speak on my behalf. So that if people basically work in, the, in, in, this, in this business uh, and we're in a union, which is the workers on the organization, that it would be hard to fire one person in the union because they don't walk out on strike. So again, unions, and we'll talk more about that later this year in the first chapter we cover in, in school, uh, basically believe in collective bargaining. Now, you're wearing the baseball stuff right now, yes? Collective bargaining is where we say, I'll let the union negotiate on my behalf. So if the co factory owner wants to fire one individual guy, you're probably going to have to take on the entire union. And the reality is, Americans back in the 1800s didn't like unions. Not at all. And there were some big strikes. One of them is that you've heard of Andrew Carnegie, the steel guy, Carnegie Hall, Carnegie Deli. What's his, also Carnegie Mellon University in Pittsburgh. There were some major strikes in the 1870s, 1880s, and 1890s, where the workers went on strike. The thing is, most business owners then and now absolutely freaking hate unions. They hate them because they basically drive up the price, and I can't fire Joe Schmo over here because I'll have to fire everybody in the union, and I can't no law go on strike. When, it, when people go on strike, the work doesn't get done. Products don't get made. I'll give you an example. If there's a strike, and this would be really bad for Apple, at um, Foxcom, I think it's called, which is the big city in China where they basically make iPads and stuff. If there was a strike, we would not, that Apple would have no new iPads and computers, right? One thing that does happen, there's going to be a Sherman Antitrust Act. This is pretty significant. A trust, essentially, another word for monopoly. This was done under, this is in 1890, this was done under um, Benjamin Harrison. And what it says, it's supposed to crack down on businesses that own everything, like a monopoly. So let, let me know what, what you know about monopolies. Tell me, give me a company that has a monopoly. Apple does. No. For they're cell phones? The only people that I, I know. They're but you, do, you, don't, you don't need 100 percent. But if you have like a good 80 percent or 70 percent, right. that's a pretty good monopoly. You, almost no one owns everything. And we'll learn more about that in chapter 24 when school begins next week. But generally speaking, the thing about the Sherman Antitrust Act, they still talk about it today, is it says illegal. Illegal combinations in restraint of trade, illegal combinations in restraint of trade is supposed to, in most people's view, make it difficult for a guy in the steel industry or the, uh, the coal industry or in the oil industry to own the whole industry. And we'll talk more about that in, again in Chapter 24. You probably didn't know the name Rockefeller, Rockefeller Plaza. Rockefeller owned a company we'll learn more about next week called Standard Oil. And they ran, they had like 90% of the oil refining in the country. 90%, that's a monopoly. So just be aware, the Sherman Act Trust Act is supposed to crack down against illegal combinations in restraint of trade. But corporations who hate unions, they almost always do, realize, couldn't collective bargaining also, Ellie, be considered an illegal combination in restraint of trade? Let's put it this way. If these people combine together collectively and form this union that's on strike, well, they're not they're restraining trade, right? Because they're not making products. 
That's true. So this is one of the big strikes they actually had back in uh, 1892. It's called the Homestead Strike. And the reality is Homestead Steel is a Carnegie company. And that is 1892. I don't think it's even. It's like 1892. Think about these strikes. People died during these strikes. Like dozens of people got shot. The rest of these problems. Generally speaking, the presidents don't like unions. So the reality, and, and when I say don't like, I in most cases, in this, particularly this era, most presidents hate unions and think they're criminal conspiracies because it's a bunch of workers conspiring to join this organization and go on strike as a whole thing and nothing will actually be made. When I was younger, baseball had a bad strike. We didn't cancel the World Series for Pearl Harbor. We didn't cancel the World Series for World War II. We canceled the World Series in 1994 because the baseball players went on strike. So just keep in mind that there are lots of big strikes, and these strikes often got bloody. And generally speaking, people like Grover Cleveland, who's going to be president during some of this stuff, uh, some of these strikes, I mean, the, this particular strike happened under Benjamin Harrison. But generally speaking, even though we made help help make the Sherman Antitrust Act, the Sherman Antitrust Act was used by corporate com corporate lawyers who went to court and got a court order ordering you back to work. What if you don't go back to work? And if you have a court order, it's called an injunction that says you got to go back to work. What if you don't go back to work? Well, they can throw you in jail. The thing is, most people think that most workers have a right to strike. Certain people, like teachers, can't go on strike in a public school because they've got, they're neglecting their kids. The kids are getting no education. They're not going anywhere. Not, it's not fair. But many public employees are not supposed to strike. So there's going to be, we still have strikes today, but not like we used to. Just keep in mind that also the reality, sorry, one of the things that's also significant is there's millions of farmers out there. And they're not in a union, right, because they're all against each other. But they're all on the same side. I mean, you farmers, uh, they're going to try to form something of a union. Why would it be hard for like wheat and corn farmers to form a union, even though they're doing sort of the same thing? Why would it be hard, Ellie? They don't make, they don't make the same thing. Well, farmers generally grow food, right? It's my farm, Bryant Farm, versus Fishbine Farm. And the reality is, I'm sort of against you. People in a union cooperate, they share, they collectively bargain. What if I told you that farmers actually have a lot of a, a really good beef, a really good argument? So let's take a look at this. Farmers can't really join a union, although they'll try to form stuff like unions. But farmers are independent businessmen. And there is an organization that existed then, it exists now, called the National Grange. It's a farmer's organization that's founded in like the 1870s. It's over 150 years old, apparently, if I remember correctly. So the thing about it is, it's a farmer organization that runs square dances and does, you know, shows up at the state fair, because farmers have a lot of the same enemy. The enemy of the farmer is the railroad. The enemy of the farmer is the bank. And businesses are, and farmers, let's face it, if I'm in business, I have workers who work as a hourly wage. Most people who thought to be for themselves to be farmers were family farmers. Their family had been farming for a long time. This National Grange is an organization that technically it's called the Patrons of Husbandry. I don't expect you to know anything about husbandry. It sounds like husband, but it sort of makes sense. It's professional animal breeders. So they have like the best cow, the best steer, the best whatever, the animals, pigs, biggest, fattest pig, so you get the most pork and the rest of that stuff. The best chicken ever. What's significant, this National Grange is sort of like a union. It's a club. And they have, they realized, you know, in our farmer's club, 
you, I, I don't hate other farmers, but I'm in competition. Because if I'm a corn farmer, there are literally, Ellie, 10,000 other corn farmers out there, at least. And reality is, whoever sells corn the cheapest is going to make the most money. The problem is, if I want to make corn the cheapest, I have to buy all this equipment and stuff, machinery, like threshers and combines and all this other stuff, right? The problem with that is, I have to borrow money from the bank if I'm a farmer, and I hope to make all my money on all the crops I grow. Why would railroads be the enemy of the farmer? I'll give you a hint. Something that's out in the parking lot and all over the place was not invented yet. Car? Uh -huh. What makes a car run? It's called the internal yeah. combustion engine. There's no cars, there's no trucks. There's horses. There's horses and railroads. Railroads is, as people call them, steel horse, uh, iron horse. What's significant though, railroads sold land to farmers and Railroads move the farmer's crop to market. And in fact, next to the farm, I'm sorry, next, the farmers would send their crops by rail to people who'd buy their crop, like Kellogg's or Drake's or, you know, when it, the, whoever, you know General Mills, the company that makes Wheaties or Budweiser. Um, so the railroads sort of knew, and in many places, the railroads knew that. You living in Kansas, you don't have like five choices of railroad companies. There's one or two or maybe three, but most in most rural areas. And again, this is a rural organization. It's not urban. Urban is city. So they're not city people. The reality is this. This is very true. It's really important. Every year. In the 1880s and 1890s, there's going to be less farmers every year. Why do you think that's true? Why would there be less farmers in 1890 than there were in 1880? What do you think the work those farmers ended up doing? Going broke. They went broke. And the problem with that is deflation. The prices of the crops, which we talked about yesterday in yesterday's video, the prices of the crops are dropping. And when they drop, that gets to the point where they can't make money anymore. Railroads ship the farmers' crops. There's no tractor trailers. There's no interstate trucks. There's no interstate hybrids. Trucks don't even exist yet because the internal combustion engine hasn't been invented by a guy named Otto, uh, who basically sort of worked with a company you may have heard of called Mercedes-Benz. Internal combustion engine, the cylinders, all that, that wasn't invented yet. So farmers really don't like railroads, and they don't like the bank, because the bank charges them high interest. And railroads knew that they had farmers over a barrel, because they could say, well, if you want to move your crop, uh, we'll charge you $10,000 to move this crop to, 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 from, uh, from Iowa to Chicago. And you don't have a choice to say, well, I'll just choose a different railroad. In Iowa, there aren't that many railroads. So it, the railroads sort of are a monopoly. Um, so to keep that in mind. So railroads also store the crops of the farmers in what they call a grain elevator, which is right next to the railroad tracks is a really tall building that they store corn and rice and whatever else, wheat, in a big warehouse. The railroad owns the grain elevator. The railroad and the bank basically are the enemies of farmers. So this National Grange is a farmer's organization. And they said, you know, we've got a lot of the co same common enemies. Banks hurt us because when we can't pay back our loans, what happens? There's an F word. Foreclosure. Foreclosure. They take your farm. Now, as bad as that is, it's not only your workplace, it's your home. It's your home. So what ended up happening is, a lot of people were leaving rural areas and moving to urban areas. And that trend would continue till today. There aren't that many farmers left, comparatively to how many people are actually working in factories, even in that era. The, in a seesaw, the factories are going up, and the people working in factories, some of them were immigrants, 
Some of them were poor people. Uh, generally weren't paid very well. There was no minimum wage or anything like that. Plus, a lot of farmers went out of business and ended up working in factories. A farmer is sort of a slave to his farm. He can't not go, he can't go on vacation. He can't, he has to milk the cows every day, otherwise they get sick and die. He's got to basically grow his crop and it's like a 16 hour day. So the reality is farmers grow food which we need to live. The problem is, the problem is farmers are seeing deflation, prices dropping. And generally in the, night, in the 1870s and 80s and 90s, the price of their crops are dropping. And there's lots of reasons for that. But one big reason we said yesterday was an over word. What was that word you said yesterday? It was an over something that was hurting farmers. Overproduction. They're growing too much damn wheat. They're growing too much corn. There's, it's, just, it's just very competitive. So keep in mind that also that this national grange would say, you know, we're in a club with other farmers, and there were grange lodges, this national grange still exists. But some people said, you know, maybe we should form, well, we farmers, we should also become like a union. And maybe we're all in the same business. We have the same enemies, bankers and farmers. And we basically hate the federal government because the federal government likes to stop inflation. And if you're a farmer, the only thing that keeps you in business is inflation. They need to get more money for their crops because that's all they make is wheat or corn. And a lot of these farmers are one crop people. So what's significant? This is sort of another is a kind of club. It was the farmer alliances. There was a northern alliance. There was a southern alliance. There was a colored alliance for black farmers. What's significant? It's sort of a union for farmers. In some ways, not unlike the Grange. I don't think it exists anymore. What's significant, it was a movement that said, where farmers said, we're getting screwed and ripped off by the banks, the railroads, the federal government hates us, we don't get anything from the government. Now you may remember during the Civil War that the government did do something nice for farmers. They created something called the Homestead Act, where they gave 160 acres of land to people who move out to the middle of nowhere and basically make the farms. The reality is, the government doesn't like farmers. Now, you may say, well, how do family farmers make it today? Uh, the government, like, works with them, like, cooperatively. The government will actually pay farmers, even in the modern era, not to grow food. Because if they all grew 100% of the food they could grow, the price of a, of, a, of a loaf of bread would be like 30 cents and everybody would be out of business. So just be aware that that stuff about giving farmers money from the federal government, that, that was not a popular idea at the time. Uh, and the only president, the first president to start that was, uh, was actually Franklin Roosevelt in the 1930s. He thought farmers maybe should get a check from the government to not grow excess food so that the prices are kept high enough so that you know, supply and demand. We don't want too much supply because there's not enough demand. We can't eat 10 boxes of cereal every morning. So this farmers alliances are like a club. It's sort of like the Grange. The Grange ended up being essentially more of a political organization, more of a social organization. They ran square dances, they shared stuff on the best fertilizers and seed and chemicals and the rest of it. The Farmers Alliance, in a lot of ways, is like a big Costco. Let me explain. If I'm a farmer and I need to, to buy a combine, not the football combine, but the one, the thing that actually cuts the wheat and McCormick Reapers and all this other machinery, I'm not an expert on farm. If I have to buy an expensive piece of equipment from a company like International Harvester or John Deere, uh, which make lawnmowers and farming equipment, I will have to pay a lot of money for that. What's the, what, how does Costco make money? It's cool, so. What's that? Massive quantities. Massive quantities. Plus, you pay a fee to be a member every year. Well, so the National Alliance, the Farmers Alliances. So I have to go out and buy a tractor. They'll be invented someday. Well, what if the Farmers Alliance bought 10,000 tractors at the same time? And I get a cheaper price for the one tractor or two tractors I need, because Ellie, I'm 
I'm part of an organization that's buying 10,000 or 100,000 bags of seed or fertilizer or anything. They bought in bulk. Buying in bulk is almost always cheaper. That's what, I mean, if you, you, you make a mistake if you said, I need a four pack of batteries. Go to Costco, what happens? There's like a 50 pack of AA batteries. I just needed four. But the price per battery is pretty good. The Farmers Alliance is really like that. Now, being that racial issues were so bad at the time, there was also a colored alliance, that's the term that they used for African Americans, where black farmers, most of them being sharecroppers and tenant farmers, also would try to buy in bulk and would sort of lobby for stuff they cared about. Now, here's the deal. So let me erase some of this. The National Grange, remember what we said, the railroads, and the bankers are the enemy. Bankers hate inflation. They like deflation, because their money is worth more every year, believe it or not. So organizations like the Grange and these alliances want to, term you're familiar with, regulate things like railroads. Do we have regulations today on thousands of things? Is there regulations on OU products, Orthodox Union, to make sure it's kosher? No? Yeah. Can't have any pork in it. Can't have meat and dairy mixed together. There's regulations. The difference is those are not government regulations. Those are glatt kosher, that's a private organization, Orthodox rabbis and stuff, who make sure that the food is on the level. We really didn't have a lot of regulation, which was government red tape, to make sure that businesses didn't overcharge and rip off people like farmers when they had to move their crop. And the reality is, the National Grange started to think, you know, we should actually support candidates running for a state office that actually want to get tough on the railroads. So let me basically pull up a map. Railroads, as we said, so I'll keep talking as I'm doing this, let's look at an 1890 U.S. railroad map. 1890 U.S. Railroad map. Let's see what we got. There's a lot of railroads. <laughs> I know it sounds crazy, but they're not as many as you think. So, uh, this is it. So, there are some choices now in Wyoming, which is the least populated state here where the cursor is. There's not a lot of railroads. And for some places, there are choices. But realistically, railroads, this is what the railroad network looked like in 1890. Well, what if I told you that organizations like the Grange and the Farmers Alliance thought, well, maybe we should try to have the state make regulations about the railroads. Like, you can't charge too much to move my crop from A to B. So that they should not actually charge a ridiculous amount of money that the railroad's just taking it as pure profit plus, again, Farmers generally bought their land from the railroads. So the railroad had a captive audience of people who are farmers who were going to sort of have to use that railroad. Now, what if we had some kind of regulation in the railroads where it can't cost more than X to ship something from A to B, or from Toledo to, uh, to, to, to somewhere in, in the south, New Orleans? So just be aware, the organizations like the Grange say, we should support political candidates on the state level who can regulate the railroads. There's a problem. There's a couple cases we'll learn about. That's Illinois. It's insane. Illinois, of course, has Chicago. Tons of products are going to move through Illinois. They still do today by rail. Now we have interstate highways and trucks and stuff, but they didn't have any of that stuff then. What's the problem, would you think, if the state tried to regulate railroads in the state of Illinois. It's on the map. What would be difficult about the state of Illinois trying to regulate the railroads in Illinois? I'll give you a help. Intra versus inter. These railroads are interstate. Between two states. So what? Well, if you read your constitution, the federal government deals with interstate stuff. 
And you say, well, we're going to make layer, we're going to be tough on the railroads and the farmers in Illinois and lots of farmers in Illinois. Well, the people on the state level can't, can't regulate them because it's the railroad the leaves the state, state lines. It goes to Indiana and 10 other states. The problem is farmers said, we're getting screwed by everybody. Farmers, we don't have a chance because the railroads and the banks can do whatever the heck they want to us and we have to tolerate it. And they, when we can't pay back the loans to the bank, they take our farm, they foreclose on my farm. When I can't move my crop for a cheap price, I go out of business because the railroad could charge me anything. So just be aware, this whole thing you're looking at is interstate commerce between at least two states. Really between like, well, it's gonna be 48 states. So it's hard for the state to get too tough on a business because the railroad goes interstate. And interstate commerce is not the domain of the state. You might remember a case last year called Gibbons versus Ogden about steamboats. That case took place back in 1819, 1820. That was under uh, uh, John Marshall, who was the Chief Justice, and he said that interstate commerce, uh, basically a boat ferry going from New Jersey to, uh, to New York City, was interstate, and the state of New Jersey or New York cannot directly re regulate that because it's an interstate business. Just keep that in mind. There's another thing too. Farmers start saying, you know, northern farmers generally are Republicans. Southern farmers, the white farmers, are almost all Democrats. Like, think of the old former Confederacy, redemption. What if the farmers didn't have much luck with the National Alliance being like a political party? It's like a club. Costco's not a club. It's not a Costco party. What if I told you, and there are millions of farmers, at the time, maybe farmers should form, you know, we have the Grange, we work together, we share stuff, we do square dances, share chemicals and fertilizers and best ideas about how to basically grow a lot of crops. What if we actually had a farmer's party? And we'll call it a populist party. It's a farmer club, but more than a club, it's a political party. Now, in the South, the Democrats were big here. Remember, the Republican Party really died in the South after Reconstruction ended in 77. The Northern farmers are mostly Republican. You know, people said, you know, farmers, the Northern Republican farmers, these guys over here are generally Republican, generally Democrat here. What if we formed a political party that would basically be a farmer's party? So instead of voting Democrat and splitting the vote between the North and the South, what if we had a combined populist party, populist means people, a people's party that would be like a really neat idea that we'd have a, you know, you wouldn't vote Democrat anymore. You'd vote for the populist party. And the populist party could do all the stuff we want. So just keep that in mind. That's a possibility. And there's lots of things that farmers want. They want to be able to regulate the railroads so railroads don't rip them off on when they have to move their crop and store their crop before it goes to market. Banks hate farmers because when farmers can't pay back their loans, they foreclose, the bank forecloses and gets the farm. So bankers and farmers are generally debtors. They're borrowing money from the bank to go out and buy equipment and seed and fertilizer and stuff, and they make their crop, and they hope they make enough money at the end of the year to make, them, make a living. Well, what if I told you Take a look. That this People's Party, it's going to be a third party. Now, there was a great American historian who lived in the 1940s who talked about the, uh, his name was, you don't have to worry about his name, but his name was Richard Hostetter. And he said that basically third parties are like bees. So if you are stung by a bee today, that stinks for you. What happens to the bee? It dies. It dies. This populist party, it's not Democrat, it's not Republican, it's the populist party. And they have what they call a platform, stuff they stand for. What if I told you that these farmers, now some people are going to say the farmers are freaking nuts. But what if I told you that these farmers could form a political party, there are millions of farmers at the time, and that would be a good alternative to the Democrats or Republicans. 
And again, Southern Democrats basically live in the South, and Northern farmers basically a Republican. What if they voted for this populist party? We could actually do stuff. We wouldn't have to share anything with other people. So what do these people want? Now, the party is founded in 1892. There's lots of things they want. Now, remember what I told you was the number one source of revenue for the country, Ellie? Paris. What if we had, and it sounds crazy, but they call it graduated income tax, meaning Derek Jeter pays a higher tax rate than I do as a school teacher. What if we had the part of populist party platform in the 1890s says lots of stuff. We want what they call, again, I'll explain this in a second, a graduated, meaning it goes up with the more money you make, income tax. There really wasn't one at the time. By the way, the thing about it at the time, because there's no federal income tax, if you made a million dollars, you kept a million dollars. It wasn't like, well, i got to give away 40% to that doesn't take into account state income taxes. California, let's face it, if you are make $10 million in California, not only is the federal government taking like 40%, but the state of California also takes like 12% more of your salary. That's why, just one quick, quick thing, Derek Jeter has a residence in Florida. Florida has no state income tax, which meant he didn't have to pay tax, you know, taxes in the state paid federal income tax like everybody does. Except Derek Jeter said, I'm really not a New York resident even though I play for the New York Yankees. He said, I'm a Florida resident and being that my main home is in Florida, I shouldn't have to pay the 10% or whatever it is, 10, 11% that New York State on my big salary of $20 million, whatever it was. Uh, I'll give you another example. Eli Manning pays a ton of money in federal and state tax now, he lives in New Jersey, so he pays state tax for New Jersey. He also basically pays federal income tax. They take like half of his money. Elvis Presley, the king of rock and roll down the road, was in a 90% tax bracket at one time. Meaning, if he made $10 million, he paid $9 million in taxes. Sounds crazy, right? Well, there is no income tax. So the farmers say, why don't rich guys and businesses are getting super rich? We'll learn more about that in chapter 24. Why don't we like tax these businesses at a really high rate? Maybe take 40% of their money. So that's one thing. Another thing, direct election to senators. Senators are now direct elected directly. What if I told you, you know how? We chose our senators back then. I mean, it's still a six-year term, you know, 150 years ago. But, you know, under the Constitution, you know, the House of Representatives, which is the Congress, or congressman, is elected by us, the people. Your state legislature, in our case, Trenton, or if you're in New York, Albany, chose your, your senator every six years. Remember I showed you the picture yesterday, the really big fat guy, basically, and all these businesses that controlled the Senate? The Senate knew that if we kept the state legislature happy, we'll keep our job. Now, the really famous case was Lincoln Douglas. Stephen Douglas ran against, was running for re-election against this guy, Abraham Lincoln, which most people never knew much about, and later on becomes president of the Civil War and the rest of it. But it was, they were trying to convince the state legislature. What if we, instead of the corrupt state legislature, actually had direct election of senators like we do with House Representatives? The Congress. That populace want that stuff. There's other stuff they want too. They want the government to be more responsive to them. So let's take a look. Let's see if I can pull up. They have in the populist party platform, let's see if I have a picture of this. There we go. There's lots of stuff they want. They want Silver currency, that would definitely cause inflation. They want a graduated income tax, direct election of senators, secret ballots so that I don't have to announce publicly, I am voting for blah. You used to sort of have to do that at the time. They want the government, this is a populist party, they want the government to start coining lots of gigantic quantities of silver. What would that mean? Well, that would mean that 
there'd be a lot of inflation. So that my 43 cent crop this year will be 51 cents next year, will be 60 cents the year after that. In, silver would cause inflation because silver is plentiful. Is a problem. Way back in Benjamin Harrison's day, actually before that, there was, it was before the, like before the Gilded Age, the government said, because they're having all these farmers screaming at them, let us coin silver, because silver would cause inflation, so we'll make more money on our crops, and thus we can make as much wheat as we want. We'll always be able to charge more, and we're paying back the bank with dollars worth less. So about this, the government had done a couple of things to help farmers. One of them is called the Bland-Allison Act. Bland and Allison were, set, were congressmen or senators. And what the government said, if I remember correctly, back in 1878, is that the government would buy a certain quantity of silver and coin that and put that in the currency. So that, that would add inflation. You know, face it, if you were told tomorrow, Ellie, that the amount of money in circulation will be doubled next year, then a price of jeans that, that you know, for a pair of jeans that are $30 next year should probably be like 60, right? There's twice as much more money out there. So this Bland Allison Act was an idea back in the 1870s where the government would allow some limited coinage of silver. Fast forward, 1890, and it's the same name, the Sherman, when it comes to Sherman's brother, the general, his brother, John Sherman, Silver Purchase Act. The government said, because, by the way, I want to tell you, the government really cheated with the Bland Allison. Because the government said, back in Bland Allison days, this is a con an act of Congress that passed and was basically ratified. The government would buy between two and four million dollars worth of silver every month and put it in the currency. Two things: the government never bought four million dollars four million dollars worth of silver. They always bought the bare minimum. So they did technically coin only two million dollars worth of silver. It gets worse. The government, the federal government, which is based in Washington D.C., never distributed these silver coins, these silver dollars. So there really wasn't any inflation. Farmers see inflation because they overproduction. They produce too many crops. If they can change the money supply to something like silver, they love greenbacks. That was great. Unbacked money, they could just jack up the price. But the fact is the government took greenbacks out of circulation. The government in 1890, and this actually happened under Benjamin Harrison, made a sh just the same name. Sherman made John Sherman from Ohio. Again, William to comes to Sherman's brother. Sherman made the Antitrust Act we talked about, John Sherman also made the Silver Purchase Act, which said that the federal government would buy a certain quantity of silver every month, a quantity, not a range. And the deal was the government would buy 4.5 million ounces of silver and coin. So this happened in 1890, in 1891, in 1992, the government started to have coin silver. And they actually did, just did distribute it. It's a problem. If I'm looking at my wallet, and I have silver currency, and I have gold currency, which do you really want? Gold. Why? You're right, it's worth more. It's worth more. So the reality is, it didn't really hurt Benjamin Harrison too bad, but it destroyed Grover Cleveland's second term because the country went into the worst depression in its history. And there really wasn't a way to get the, I mean, unemployment was high and people were losing their farms and losing their jobs. Grover Cleveland is a, is a gold guy. He thinks that we should not coin any silver at all. And in fact, something bad happened to the US government. Apart from the terrible depression that put thousands of businesses out and people lost their homes and were homeless. Remember one other thing back then, there was no government safety net. Like there's no welfare, there's no like benefits, there's no like applied housing to go get a place to live. None of that stuff exists. So if you can't pay to live, maybe you have to live on maybe you're gonna have to live on charity from a church or a temple or something. He got rid of the silver purchase act. And you say, why? He said, because people are turning in their silver cook dollars for gold ones. The government, you've heard of Fort Knox? Fort Knox? 
they, 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 they store gold and silver. What if I told you that the country's, the nation's supply of gold was dwindling a lot during his second term? His second term is a complete disaster. Very bad depression, uh, it goes on for years, people blame him, people generally will blame the president when the economy goes bad. And people said, you know, we're, we're running out of gold, and the government is running out of gold, so maybe we should repeal this. This is, the only, this is the only medicine to help farmers. Silver will cause inflation. There's tons of silver out there. So he thought, I know the farmers are going are to want to kill me. I mean, literally. But I'm going to repeal, I'm going to get the Congress to repeal the Sherman Civil Purchase Act. Because the country was down, the federal government was down to like $40 million worth of gold left. We used to have like hundreds of millions of dollars in gold. And they repealed that, and farmers went freaking crazy. Farmers are vulnerable to prices, the price to move their crops. Farmers are vulnerable to railroad companies. So if you go back to the populist party, they want lots of things that would help farmers, including a large quantity of silver. Coin silver, they want what they call the free coinage of silver. That 60 ounces of silver would be equal to one ounce of gold. And that, there's tons of silver out there, literally. And that would basically cause inflation, so prices would rise. Problem is, I go to the supermarket. I don't want to see the price of a loaf of bread go to $2. The farmer would love a price of a loaf of bread to cost a million dollars. And that sounds really extreme, but farmers can't, they, they need to get the prices up. The problem is, I'm a consumer. And remember what I also said this a, minute, a couple minutes ago? Farmers are going out of business all the time. Farmers want inflation. Me in New Jersey, I do not. I do not want to see the price of gas go to four dollars or higher. I want to pay two dollars a gallon, so I can drive my big gigantic SUV or anything like that. So what's significant? This populist party platform is this farmers organization. He's just trying to put a key in the door. Hi. Right. So the farmers want un the unlimited coinage of silver. Now people. That's the populist, these are all things in the populist party platform. There's a problem. They support other stuff too. That would help like union people. Like an eight hour day to work at the factory. Instead of a 12 hour day or 11 hour day. They, that doesn't affect the farmers. Why do you think this populist party may, supported also in their platform an eight-hour day, although they really don't care about the eight-hour day for workers? Why do you think they did? Why do you think the populist party thought, like, who, who would want an eight-hour day? You tell me. Instead of a 12-hour day. Who would want an eight-hour day in the factory? But by law, like the state law. Yeah, workers. I don't work eight hours. I don't work. I want to work eight hours. I don't want to work 12 hours a day, seven days a week, or six days a week. The reality is, they did support an eight-hour day as well. But that was only to get East Coast people who might be you know, union people or people working in factories. The problem with the populist party, it's basically, Ellie, just a farmer's party. And remember what I said, every year there were less farmers. Less farmers, less farmers. Today, only about 2 or 3% of the population of America is farming. And it's really sad, because a lot of farms, people have lost their farms over the last 100 something years. And it's really sad, but those people now work at jobs at factories, or working at an insurance company, or me teaching here at Kushner. So, the problem is, the populist party, the good news for the populace, they got founded in 1892, they ran a guy for president you never heard of, back, and that was the election that got Grover Cleveland back a second time. They had a guy named James Weaver, who was their candidate in 1892. Let me pull that up. So let's take a look. The 1892 election. This populist party ran for the first time. So let's take a look. Actually. I have a good website. You're probably familiar with it too. 270 to win. I'm going to stop in a few minutes, okay? What if I told you that the 
that the Populist Party, good news, bad news, it did pretty well on its first election. Way, way back. Way back. Sorry. Let's go back. Here we go. Eighteen ninety-two. Okay, there are five yellow states. The gold color is the Populist Party. So if you look here, this is the one where Grover Cleveland won in the second term. He not only had more electoral votes, he had enough. Benjamin Harrison, who lost his re-election bid in 1892, came in second. What's the good news, bad news about the populist? Look at the map. What's the problem with the populist? They're only in farmer states. They're only in farmer states. Plus, the good news for them is, you had a pretty good showing. You got 22 electoral votes. The problem is, 22 electoral votes doesn't get you anything. Doesn't get you anything. So the reality is, we did say in 93-94 that in 93-94, the country went into a very bad depression. That was like the worst one we ever had. I know you're going to hear that term a lot. Oh, this is the worst one ever. But it really was pretty terrible. And again, there's no government safety net. There's no federal welfare. It's not the, gov the government's not a major employer. There's no Social Security. There's no Medicare. There's no Medicaid. None of that stuff exists yet. Let's take a look. What are the farmers' options? This populist party people. Let's, let's scroll down. So that was 1892. What if, if one of these two parties, the Democrats or the Republicans, fused, meaning joined with the populist party? What would be the advantage to the populace if the Democrats, for example, which we'll actually have, fused with the populist party? Look at the votes. A million votes for James Weaver, the populist. 5.1 million votes for Benjamin Harrison, the Republican. 5.6 million votes for Grover Cleveland. The populace could make the difference. There's a problem. Why would populace, the party, not really want to join with another party, like the Democrats or Republicans. Why do you think that's the case? What would be the danger to the Populist Party? Which is more important, the Populist Party or the Democratic Party? Democratic. The Democratic Party. It's a party that's been around since Jackson. 